Hey guys, how you doing? Um, as promised, uh, I'm back in my office just after teaching you guys, um, just to give you this final lecture. I don't think it's going to be a very long lecture, um, but but what I like about it and the reason I want to give this is I think it ties together um, several aspects of what we've been talking about recently in the course and some of the things I do to you in the course. And, and I think some of the things that I hope you will expect um, from other courses and maybe even demand from other courses. So I have a little bit of a, I don't know, an academic political agenda, I guess, tied to some of this. Um, so <clears throat> let's just kind of get into it. All right. So to PowerPoint, off we go. Um, let's just do this. Hey, where's my, there we go. Okay. So what I want to, this lecture to be about is one of the things that I'm actually pretty passionate about um, as an educator and as a, as a researcher. It relates to a lot of my research. And that is, we, we've been talking about the fact that rational thought is not um, natural. And let me actually kind of jump to here. Um, so if I challenge you with this question, think of your opinions. What, what's the best kind of music? What, um, what kind of clothes are fashionable and what kind of clothes aren't fashionable? Um, I don't know, what's a good car to drive? What's, you know, any, anything, any opinion that you hold in life? Let me ask you this question. How did you come to that opinion? Did you come to that opinion by rationally thinking about all of the options and then intellectually deciding which option is best uh, for some principled reason. The claim I will give you is probably not. For the vast majority of ideas and opinions you hold, you probably came to them in a very different way. Uh, and so I want to highlight two ways we come to opinions that don't have to do with rational thought. And we've talked about these a little bit, but let me just make them a little clearer. Um, this bozo does not refer to me, although if I ever lost my hair, I might look remarkably like that. Um, it refers to a study, and let me give you a sense of the study. Um, this is a study on, on what's called observational learning, and it's a re relatively famous one. Um, students, students, children, were shown a, a film, and different groups of sh students were shown different films. Um, in, in one group, they saw a film with people um, just acting sort of normally, um, so a little story unfolded, but it was, you know, whatever. Um, it was just sort of typical boring, I, I don't know, I don't want to call it boring, but it was sort of neutral. But in the other group, the children saw a film that looked like what you're seeing here. They saw uh, an, an individual, a grown-up in this case, um, violently attacking a bobo doll, doing all sorts of things. So sitting on it, and hitting it, throwing it in the air, punching it, kicking it. Um, all this kind of stuff. So they saw this play out, watched it, and then after the video, all of the children, um, after they watched the video, were allowed to go into a playroom. The playroom had all kinds of stuff, um, including very benign stuff, like building blocks and dolls and um, you know toy trucks and, and balls and that kind of thing, but it also included a Bobo doll. Um, so these Bobo dolls, in case you don't know them, they're just weighted on the bottom, so if you hit them, they fall backwards, but then they come back up again, so you can beat them up. Um, what the study showed is those children who had watched this video depicting an adult being violent towards the Bobo doll um, mimicked the behavior they saw. Um, you know, in a very straightforward way. So you're kind of seeing here a little boy and a little girl. You're seeing, you know, them straddling and, and hitting it from sitting on top of it. You're seeing them throw the Bobo doll. You're seeing them strike it, in this case, with a hammer, I think. Both cases with a hammer. Oh, I guess she's got a hammer, too. Look at that. So they're hitting with a hammer. They're kicking. So the things that they saw, they do. And the claim of this, so, so this is related to a few things, of course. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the uh, controversy over having children view violence in, in um, television shows, in movies, and especially in video games where they're actually participating in the violent behavior. Does that make them more violent in real life? 
Um, there's some strong arguments. Most of the data, though, especially with respect to younger children, but generally, um, fall on the yes side of that question, and this this certainly does. So you know, these children seeing violence were more likely to be violent. The children that didn't see the violence, by the way, were more likely to use the blocks and the other toys, and so they still played with things. They just didn't reenact this violence. Um, so it relates to that, but more generally, if we step back more generally. It also relates to a general learning mechanism we know has a big impact on all of us, uh, something we call observational learning. And really what it suggests is that much of what we do, how we behave, and the opinions we hold, we do so because those around us do so too. We conform. Um, we, we see all these people that believe something to be true and act in certain ways, and so we tend to mimic those actions. In fact, we found so-called mirror neurons in the brain <clears throat> that we that we know um, light up when we see some action, and it's kind of like us doing the action in our mind when we see it. So when we see somebody do something, we're already kind of feeling what it would be like to do it, and that seems like a precursor to us actually doing it. So important point about observational learning: it doesn't really involve rational thought, right? It's it's just you're doing it because other people are doing it. Now, I don't include it in these slides, but we've also talked a lot about classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Uh, and so imagine you start out by mimicking what people do. Maybe you mimic that in all contexts, but then you're rewarded differentially in different contexts, and the rewards and punishments will now shape your behavior more. So you might learn that, oh, you can be aggressive around your friends, but you can't be aggressive around your parents or in your school, something like that, because you get punished for it. Um, and so your behavior gets a little more complex and honed. But again, think of operant and classical conditioning. It's not really about rational thought. Um, it's more about the rewards and punishments shape and change the way you behave. But you almost, the claim is, you're almost not aware of the influence they are having. They just shape your behavior and change it and you end up, you know, for example, I've talked about us being different people around different people because we adapt our behavior, but we do it again in a relatively non-conscious way. We don't consciously say, oh, I'm around my girlfriend's parents and therefore I'm going to be you know, really polite and nice and friendly. That just kind of happens. Um, it just kind of emerges um, in, in a really natural way. Okay, so point. Very natural ways to learn. Observational learning, as you see here, things like classical and operant conditioning, but none of them requiring rational thought. Rational thought, critical thought, I sometimes like to talk about it, is not really a natural behavior. It's something we have to learn to do. Can you teach it? Well, what we would like to do at university, what I would like to do at university, and what I would like to see universities doing, is to do exactly that to teach you a number of high-level cognitive skills, thought skills, that will benefit you all through your life and to give you so much practice with them that they become second nature. So let me step back and make this point. What am I showing you here? Um, karate. I talked a little bit about in the memory chapter about how we have things like episodic memory and semantic memory. Um, and I also alluded, I think, to something called procedural memory. Uh, probably didn't talk about it too much, but let me talk about it a little bit now. Um, here's my favorite example, just to give you a context. I like to say, you can learn a lot about karate in, let's say, a one-hour lecture. But if you want to learn to do karate, you are not going to learn to do that in one hour. You're not going to learn to do that in one week, or one month, or one year. You'll get better in a year, but the only way to learn something like karate, something that requires skill and a coordination of all these um, behaviors, and in the case of karate, muscle groups, all that kind of thing, the only way to learn skills is through repeated effective practice. You can learn information just by being exposed to it. So a good lecture can give you a strong episodic memory. It can also give you information in your semantic memory. A good textbook can do the same. But if you want to learn to do something, play basketball, play electric guitar, 
do karate, um, you know, anything, drive a standard transmission car, drive a car in general, uh, anything that requires skill and, and linking certain behaviors together, you have to practice. And as you practice, you start out being crappy, but you get better and better and better. If you do karate enough, if you practice karate enough, something really interesting happens. If somebody comes up behind you in the middle of the night and grabs you from behind, your karate becomes second nature. It becomes automatic. You kick their ass first and you see who they are second and you hope it wasn't you know, some friend playing a trick on you or something like that. Um, any skill practiced enough, think of Jimi Hendrix playing electric guitar and if you don't know who Jimi Hendrix is, shame on you. Go, go to YouTube right now. Stop this lecture. Go to YouTube. Watch Jimi Hendrix. But think of somebody like that who's highly skilled. Now clearly they weren't born playing electric guitar. They got to the skill level they got by playing and playing and playing and practicing and practicing and practicing. The more you do it, the more it becomes just automatic, second nature. So Jimi Hendrix, I bet you could have a full-scale conversation with him while he cranked out some amazing guitar, um, and he could probably do that and talk to you at the same time because for him, guitar playing is just part of who he is. Um, just you know, oozes out of him. For all of you guys, what I my dream for a university is that we will give you repeated effective practice in using your thought processes certain ones I'll highlight in a moment uh, and if we do that regularly for four years while you while we have you here then maybe these things will become second nature for you and that can have really positive effects so what do I mean what, what am I even talking about what are these cognitive skills um, well here here are the usual suspects here are the things I think a lot about and worry a lot about critical thinking so what I'm giving you here is the, the term critical thinking but some these are some verbs that we kind of associate with this. So your ability to analyze things, compare things, evaluate what's better than, than what, question what you're, you're learning about, differentiate how is something subtly different from something else, categorize it, what, you know, how is it similar than other things, what category does it go to. All of these require critical thought. I would love to give you a lot of practice thinking critically because I think with that practice, your skill will develop and it will move towards second nature. Let me go more quickly through some of these other ones now. Creative thinking. So if you find a problem, can you come up with a solution? So finding solutions, building on things, improving things. Communication. And I have two, in expressive and receptive here. Expressive is how proficient you are at getting the ideas that are in your head out of your mouth in an effective, powerful way. You know, can, can you literally express your ideas well? Receptive is, can you shut up and listen to the ideas that other people express and understand and get them? Um, even, for example, when they're talking about you or yours. So you just played guitar and somebody says, let me give you, some, some, uh, let me give you my reaction to your guitar playing. Do you know enough to shut up and listen so that you might actually benefit from what that person has to say? That's called receptive communication. And so communicating well is all about how you structure your communication, how clear you are, how efficient, and how you, you know, get impact with it. I would like you guys to be constantly being pushed to use these skills. Collaboration, um, it's literally a skill to be able to work with other people well. And again, you're only going to learn that skill if we ask you to do it. And self-reflective thinking. It's kind of like critical thinking, except it's directed at yourself. Can you look at your own behavior, your own tendencies, see what you do well, but critically understand and appreciate what you're not very good at? Um, and you know that's a critical step towards getting better at anything, is realizing, well, I'm not that good at it, so I need work. I need to, I need to focus on that area. Um, this is often considered the hallmark of you know, the best students, the best employees, etc. people who are called reflective, the best professors. Think of this as a professor. You want reflective professors. You want a professor that gives you some learning experience, but then asks themselves, was that as good as it could have been? Are there any flaws in my class? Are there things I could be doing better? 
Um, if you have a reflective professor like that, well, they're probably going to keep making their class better and better all the time. Um, and, and so this is a good skill, but again, it's something you have to have experience. So back to my dream. My dream university is we would be teaching you these thinking skills. We would teach, we would be teaching you not by lecturing to you about them, but rather by asking you to use them, just like karate, asking you to think critically, asking you to think creatively, asking you to communicate, asking you to collaborate, asking you to think self-reflectively, and doing that over and over. If you did that over and over again, my claim is the skills you would learn here are perhaps more important than any content we could give you, more important than anything I tell you about psychology. Now, maybe that's useful, but you can find it all on Wikipedia anyway, in a way. But if you leave university with these skills, these are the skills that will make you successful in, in anything you decide to do in life. So how do you teach these skills? In small classes, people teach these skills by challenging their students to think. So they, it's, it's pretty easy to say, here's some idea. What do you guys think about that? You, you know, and you, you imagine the teacher pointing at people. You, what, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas? So what are you now doing? Well, you're asking the student to think critically, to express their ideas well. Um, and let's say the student does that. Then you might ask some other student, well, what do you, what do you think of their idea? Do you have any comments for them? Uh, and so you're asking somebody else now to think critically about their idea, express their ideas while this person is listening to their ideas and reflecting on them. So the idea is that in a small class, this kind of practice happens um, or can happen more naturally. I don't always think that's true, by the way. Um, most small classes you have, like, like you see here, two people who want to answer every question and a bunch of people who just want to shut up and blend into the background. Uh, and so it's difficult sometimes to get everybody participating and using these skills the way you'd like. But theoretically in a small class, it's possible. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons many people worry about large classes like ours is because you can't do this anymore. You know, in a large class like ours, what often happens for most of the time is the prof stands up there and just talks, just lectures, and you sit there and just listen. So it's very passive um, from your perspective. Again, very good for transmitting information to you, but where do you get these skills? Um, are you thinking critically? Are you getting a chance to express your ideas? Are you getting a chance to hear anybody else's opinions on your ideas? You know, no, you're not. Uh, and in fact, my biggest pet peeve at universities are large classes where they only give you multiple choice exams. Because essentially, this now becomes all about information, feeding you information and seeing if you can give it back, where, and not giving you practice with all of those things I showed you on the previous slide. So for our class, you know, going back years ago, I, I thought about this long and hard. How can we, with 1,900 students, many of who participate online, how can we give you guys the experience I think you need to really be, be successful in life? Um, how can we make sure our classes are not reduced to just transmission of information? And this, this now feels like an advertisement, but I hope by now that you see that that was the goal of the Peer Scholar assignment. Um, that you know, asking you to submit first an argument required you to think critically and to communi communicate your argument as well as you could. But now when you're assessing your peers' work, you're critically thinking which ones are good, which one isn't good, what makes one good, what kind of grade or rating would I give to that. Um, I ask you to find the, the biggest thing this person could improve. So again, you're looking at a person's work and saying, well, what is that one thing that would make the biggest difference? A lot of critical thought going on. I then ask you, by the way, to not only communicate that thing that could be improved, but to also communicate a solution, uh, a path this person could take to try to improve that work. That requires creative thought and communicating creative thought. Of course, you're working on this in a collaborative way. 
everybody's working together, so you kind of get that group thing happening. Um, caring and citizenship are other things thrown in there a little bit. Um, uh, the suggestion is we need to model this better in our classroom. Um, caring, as you hopefully realized, I took great pains to try to convince you guys all to be very pro-social, to give comments that were helpful and that were intended to be helpful thereby showing that I care about you guys and you guys care about each other. So we're modeling that. Citizenship, well, hey, we're all being good academics. Metacognition, sorry, I've changed the word on you here, but this is like self-reflective thought. This is metacognition means thinking about thinking, knowing what you know, knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at. And clearly in Pure Scholar, you know, you've written an argument and submitted it, and now you see all these other arguments. That gives you a really clear sense of how your work fits with the work of your peers. So it gives you a very strong, palpable signal of um, the strengths and weaknesses of your own work. Uh, and so hopefully you were being self-reflective. Of course, and then you logged back in, in the reflect phase, and you saw other people's reaction to your work. Now we're talking about receptive communication. You're reading those ideas given to you, you're thinking about them, I hope, uh, and deciding whether they're good or not, critical thought. You're then trying to decide how you're going to take those ideas and change your work, how you're going to revise, creative thought, and of course all of this is about your work. These are people pointing out issues with your work, so of course you're in this self-reflective kind of situation, which we even punctuate by asking you to literally reflect on the process and justify your changes. So as I step back, the reason we give you the Peer Scholar assignment um, is to provide you with structured um, practice in these sorts of high-level cognitive skills that I think are really important to your life. If I have my way, you will run into Peer Scholar in many different classes at U of T so that you'll constantly get this practice, which is what you need to develop the skills that will make you a scholar. That's why we call it scholar. We like to separate what we're trying to do here from the notion of building a database. A database is a repository of information. I don't want students at UTSC to become just repositories of information. We already have those. Uh, you know, we have Wikipedia, we have the internet. Those are repositories of information. What I want you guys to become are people that can work with information in effective ways. That's what a scholar is. Not someone who just knows a lot, but somebody who can use information in creative um, and critical ways. That you can become with practice. Peer Scholar is one example of a tool that I think can provide that practice in any size lecture hall. Um, so my claim here is, of course, that you can train thought. Um, Thought isn't natural, but it can be trained with the right structure. Um, I also like this thought amplifier. This is actually my guitar amplifier. I know it, people don't people have an image of guitar amplifiers, and this doesn't necessarily fit, but this is mine. Um, what I like to emphasize here is, and you might see this in AO2. If you look at the previous slide, I put a question mark on the first thing. The question mark is, well, what skill do you want to exercise? You can exercise any skill you want. So. What I'm thinking about for AO2, if we can pull it off, is rather than having you guys do written arguments, I'm going to ask you to find your handy dandy um, smartphone. Find your handy dandy smartphone here and do a video uh, argument. So take a short video, five minutes, of you arguing some position as effectively and clearly as you can. Um, but now we're getting nonverbal communication, we're getting a lot of this other stuff in here, um, and now I'm, and you're doing oral presentation skills without everybody staring at you, right? Because you can do this in your, in your dorm or in your bedroom or wherever you want to do it. Um, you do this video, submit the video, and so now you're submitting an oral presentation, you're working on oral communication skills, and then you think about other people's oral presentations. You think critically, you think creatively. And so everything else you do in Peer Scholar will be about whatever the task was. So it amplifies um, to an extent whatever skill you're trying to exercise with your assignment. Um, this term, that skill was presenting a clear written argument. Next term, it might be presenting a clear oral argument. It could be anything. Um, and the process just kind of amplifies it, which is really kind of cool.
All right. I want to mention a couple of things that I always try to keep in mind and I'd like you guys to think about too. When you're trying to exercise thought, like why is the school system, the general school system, sometimes looked down on? Well, a lot of students find it boring. Uh, I don't want to write a book report about Shakespeare. So, uh, you know, think about that situation. You're being told or, or whatever to engage in some exercise. And, and the goal of writing a book report or anything that they ask you to do in school is to give you practice with thought, right? They're trying to do the same thing I'm, I'm talking about here. But when they say do it on Shakespeare, if you're not into Shakespeare, it's really hard to think and exercise your thought processes if you're not interested in the topic. What I like to argue about thought is it's the exercise that's important more so than the content that students are working with. So, for example, I like to say, especially for those students who are having a real challenge in, in the normal school system, what if you gave them um, the task of something like, okay, think of your favorite video game. I don't know if this is a character for a video game. He looks like a character from a video game to me. Um, but think of your favorite video game. What is the best video game? I want you to write an argument in defense of some video game that you believe is the best video game in the world. And I want you to argue why it's the best in a clear, compelling way. Well, if you stop worrying about the content and you worry about exercising the mind, this could be a very powerful way to engage the kind of student who isn't normally engaged, the kind of student who can't wait for school to be over so they can go play their video game. But what if they're writing about something they care about and they're arguing about something they care about? That notion of engagement and sort of relevance or authenticity of, of the assignment can suddenly make them buy in and engage in the exercise in a way that's very effective. Um, I have Drake over here because, you know, you could ask them to write similarly, what's your favorite musical artist? Create an argument for why that person is the best musical artist in the world. And maybe we'll do this next term. Maybe we'll have an oral presentation about the best musical artist where you defend your best music. I'm kind of liking that. Um, and so the idea here is, you know, as an educator or as someone trying to train thought, what people are thinking about isn't that important. It's the fact that they're thinking that you want. And so maybe it makes sense to ask them to think about something they like to think about, that they want to think about. Um, and that's, that's where the mindset changes with something like a peer scholar or whatever, where you can say, you know what, it's the thought I care about. Um, so yeah, we might do that. I, I usually, by the way, go halfway here, as you, as you know from the legalizing marijuana uh, example that we did here uh, in our class. Um, the hope there was to make it relevant because this is something that's going on all around you with Cam H. So I hope to get a little bit of engagement, but while still keeping it related to psychology. Um, so I try to walk both of those grounds of, of engagement while still keeping it topic relevant. Um, but the claim I'm making here is the topic relevance is probably less important than engagement. Um, and when you start thinking about thought as exercising thought, you can get to that point very quickly and really challenge um, some curricular aspects that make education boring. All right. And sort of a, a semi-final point here. This is Dwayne, who's co-creator of Peer Scholar, by the way. And this is Tanuke, who now is, I think, making the world a better place, solving all sorts of problems and issues. She's an amazing student. Um, but I, I won't go into detail about Tanuke. Um, but I do want to say the following, that when it comes to trying to redesign the educational experience to make it the best educational experience possible there is an extent to which you guys are in a far better position than I am to judge what is a good educational experience I, I can bring a lot of theory to bear I know a lot of the data and the research uh, and you know I am a student myself in a lot of many many different situations um, so I do still have a little bit of that student mindset, but you guys as people who experience university education in a personal way are in a very important position, a very valuable position for someone like me who cares about making your experience good. Uh, and I am very open to hearing your ideas about how we can improve things um, 
and, and thinking about, you know, maybe can we build technologies that will allow us to use this in any size class, etc. Uh, I do think, by the way, sometimes you don't think about your education properly. This is gonna, I sound like an old guy now. You kids these days. But seriously, um, you guys sometimes get labeled in a negative way as consumers. You paid your money and therefore you think we owe you something. Now typically that sentence ends with we owe you good marks. Um, and I think some students do kind of think this way. I paid my tuition um, and therefore I want good grades. I want, I want to get my certificate. And when you react that way, a lot of professors and other educators go, well, no, that's not how it works at all. You have to earn your grades, blah, blah, blah. But if instead your mentality is I paid tuition um, and therefore I deserve a good quality education that's going to help me succeed in life, then I'm like, bang on, 100%, I'm with you. Uh, but it's important that you guys understand what that means. Many students like classes that are lecture followed by multiple choice. They're kind of easy to keep things in mind, easy to go through, you know the rules of the game, versus a class like mine, where I'm constantly asking them, here's digital lab code with all these due dates, here's the M tuners, four different ones at different times, here's your peer scholar assignment with three different due dates. Um, I'm using a lot of what's called active learning, pushing you to use information a lot. Why? Well, because of every reason I just told you. I want you guys to have constant exercise with these skills. Um, it's harder from your perspective. It's the same reason we're not all black belts in karate and we're not all great guitar players. Practicing is effortful, time consuming, and often we don't like it. But you should insist on it. In my opinion, you should be insisting that your professors are giving you this regular practice so that these skills become second nature and then you're sitting around the boardroom as somebody who's got really good ideas because you're a great critical thinker, can express their ideas well because you're a really good communicator, comes up with creative solutions to current problems and works well with the other people around you. You know, if you have those skills, you're gonna be a success. Uh, and I do think you should be insisting on that uh, and so that's a different way you can be an ally both in terms of you know informing um, what's working and what isn't for you but also in terms of changing the system pushing being a voice being an activist uh, for good education and I, I want to encourage you all to do that too all right that's all folks right so this is the last formal lecture um, for the exam a little bit of indoctrination in the peer scholar world, I guess. Um, but that's all we have for uh, Intro Psych Part 1. Uh, of course, there will be a Part 2 uh, coming next term. Stay tuned, and I'm sure we'll see a lot of you in it. Um, but this is where we are for now. So I'm going to stop there. All right, absolutely. Good luck on the exams, and uh, I will see you at the exam, and I'll see you next term. Right, later. Bye-bye.